So hello, and welcome to the launch of our new Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Sharon Wood, and I'm Dean of the Cockrell School of Engineering. It is really exciting for me to be here to meet with you today. This newly renovated and modernized facility, which is where I'm standing right now, represents the next step in our commitment to grow and advance additive manufacturing and research and innovation. The Walker Department of Mechanical Engineering has been a leader in this field since the inception of additive manufacturing in the 1980s. As the birthplace for selective laser sintering, or SLS as it's known, the department assumed an early leadership role. I'm sure many of you have heard Joe Beeman's story about how he got, a, he got a grant from the state of Texas to use lasers to cut metal, sheet metal, but it actually turned into selective laser sintering. So we are so proud of that history. And in addition, the department assumed an early leadership role with, by hosting the annual Solid Freeform Fabrication Symposium. This has become the world's premier conference on additive manufacturing. It attracts more than 600 researchers a year. Since we have this strong tie to SLS, um, the, the faculty in the Walker Department have led research efforts that really span the field. They go from material innovations to process development and control to machine design and to design for additive manufacturing techniques. Um, two of our faculty members, I already mentioned Joe Beeman and Dave Burrell, are well known in their roles for developing and commercializing additive manufacturing technologies that have been launched into industry. Today, this work has seeded a vibrant additive manufacturing industry in Central Texas. And this includes uh, Stratsys Direct Manufacturing, which is one of the largest service bureaus in the country, the North American headquarters of EOS, one of the global leaders in powder-based additive manufacturing of metals and plastics, Applied Laser Materials, ALM, a subsidiary of EOS, and a global leader in material systems. ALM started under a technology license from UT Austin in 2003. And Structured Polymers, an SLS materials development company founded by UT Austin alumni and recently acquired by Enovec. So I am really pleased that the leaders from these industries are going to be featured in today's, the events of today's panels. The mission of the new Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation is to advance current processes and foster innovation through research into new processes and design for best practices that enable widespread adoption of manu additive manufacturing. We plan to do this by partnering with researchers, educators, and industrial partners. We will explore the use of industrial quality processes to fabricate parts of interest to them. They will push the boundaries of industrial quality additive manufacturing into new materials, new design capabilities, and new levels of quality control and predictability and they will innovate entirely new additive manufacturing processes. Directed by Carolyn Seepersad, the center boasts over 1.5 million in state-of-the-art hardware and equipment, including uh, selective laser sintering, direct met metal laser sintering, multi-material jetting with a digital autonomy printer, and mechanical testing in microscopy. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope that you enjoy the, whole, the entire process and we very much look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to Dean Wood for that kind and, and generous introduction. My name is Carolyn Seepersad. I'm the faculty director of this new Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, in just a few moments, we'll have a panel of industry experts um, as part of our launch activities today. But first, I'd like to give you um, a little introduction to the center. As Dean Wood mentioned, our mission is to really enable widespread adoption of additive manufacturing to foster innovation through AM research and new processes and design for AM best practices. We're eager to establish partnerships with researchers, educators, and industrial partners across the country and across the world. 
um, and on a variety of TRL levels. So we'll introduce you to several new commercial machines that we have in house. We're very interested in exploring the use of these machines to fabricate parts of interest to a wide variety of, of researchers and practitioners. We're interested in pushing the boundaries of these industrial scale um, additive manufacturing machines into new materials, new design capabilities, and new levels of quality control. And we already have some of this research underway at the center. We're also interested in innovating entirely new additive manufacturing processes. And I'll give you a taste of some of the research test beds that we have under development here at the center already. So before we talk about the research and get into the panel, I really want to acknowledge um, and recognize all of the founding members of our new Additive Manufacturing Center. Um, so we have a variety of, of, of faculty members with expertise in materials like Dave Burrell in design, like Rich Crawford and myself, um, in process development and materials like Zach Page, Desi Kovar, Mehran Tarani, Joe Beeman, Bob Hebner, and Michael Cullinan. So combined, all of our researchers have a total of, a, of at least 100 years of research experience in additive manufacturing. I think there aren't many additive manufacturing centers um, who can boast of such a long history of research and development in the additive manufacturing field. Our facilities are located in the Me Mechanical Engineering Building on campus here at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, we are on the ground floor of ETC, which is our mechanical engineering home. Um, we have over 3,000 square feet of state-of-the-art laboratory space and we're growing. Um, so we have separate labs now for polymer powder bed fusion. We have um, a selective laser sintering machine in that lab, metal powder bed fusion with a DMLS technology there, a liquid polymer lab with stereolithography, as well as um, a Stratasys digital anatomy printer, and then finally a metrology lab um, that's set to be outfitted with um, a large-scale CMM, materials testing equipment, and then a variety of other metrology equipment. So we have a variety of Commercial capabilities. We can talk a little bit about um, a little bit later when we do a virtual tour of the center. But those commercial capabilities include, as I mentioned, um, DMLS, uh, stereolithography, digital anatomy printing, and then of course um, selective laser sintering. I'd like to give you a little taste of some of the research test beds um, that are already um, underway as part of the, the, the Center for Additive Manufacturing. Um, and so, as we mentioned, we have a, quite a few commercial machines, which you can see on the right hand side of this slide, but we have a large variety of research test beds that are underway and are being led by members of the center. And these test beds are concentrated in not only polymers, but also in metals and ceramics. Um, so let's take a little overview of some of these test beds. So in the metals area, one of the test beds that we have um, is micro cold spray. This is from uh, Desi Kovar and colleagues in uh, at UT Austin. With this technology, they can deposition pattern thick films uh, via high velocity impact of submicron particles onto substrates. The substrates can be polymer, metal, ceramic, even uh, Kleenex tissues. Um, and this is a room temperature process that can achieve near full density and full conductivity um, on, the de on the pattern depositions. Hybrid ceramic and metal devices are things that they can fabricate on temperature sensitive substrates. On the right hand side here, we have a microscale SLS technology. And this is being pioneered by Michael Cullinan, one of our faculty members. Um, typical additive manufacturing processes are limited in terms of feature size um, to about 50 microns or larger. And that limits its usefulness in micro or nano manufacturing applications like wafer scale interconnects. So Dr. Cullinan and his team are working on micro selective laser sintering that's capable of fabricating uh, metallic features on size scales smaller than five microns at very high speeds. So they use liquid nanoparticle beds that which they deposit on a substrate and then a laser scans those selectively to fuse particles and they can repeat that layer by layer. In the area of ceramics, we have an additive manufacturing concrete test bed. Um, we have a large um, six axis robotic arm that can build structures as, as large as two meters across and with a mortar pumping system off to the side. Um, and using this robotic test bed, we can also do interesting things like pick and place reinforcements um, and other interesting things we can build around um, structures or on top of structures and do conformal printing. On the right hand side here, you'll see selective laser flash centering of ceramics 
Um, and this is a process that's being pioneered by Dr. Kovar, Dr. Beeman, um, and their students. Um, typically, if you're familiar with additive manufacturing of ceramics, um, typically it's very difficult to directly fabricate ceramics because of the high temperatures required and the low fracture toughness of these ceramics. So selective laser flash sintering combines, it's a new process that combines an electric field with a scanning laser to lower the temperature and increase the speed of being able to laser sinter ceramics. So the goal is to, to achieve a partially sintered part very quickly with enough strength to hold its shape for sintering in an oven afterwards. We also have quite a few test beds in, in photopolymers. Um, on the left-hand side here, you can see some longhorns um, that were fabricated by Zach Page and in his research group in, the, in chemistry. Um, and this is a high resolution, high resolution visible light 3D printing process. So liquid resins rapidly polymerize into solids upon exposure to visible light. Um, it's a very low energy process and the speed, the resolution and the mechanical uniformity are competitive um, with ultraviolet methods, even though they're using um, visible light to be able to cure these parts. One of the really unique things about this process is that wavelength selective chemistry can enable graded parts with hard and soft joints. This is a really exciting development there. On the right hand side um, is a large scale high viscosity stereolithography machine. Um, and this is being built by uh, graduate students under the direction of Dr. Croft. Here is that most commercial SLA machines are limited to low viscosity resins. Here we want to be able to build with high viscosity resins. And the idea here is that we can print materials um, like elastomers with high molecular weights and nanoparticle reinforcements, um, and also to print large structures while retaining high feature resolution um, and print speed that's inherent in SLA. In terms of polymer powders, I think uh, Dean Wood mentioned that the University of Texas at Austin is the birthplace for selective laser sintering. Um, and we're continuing to innovate in that area. On the left-hand side, you'll see that we have a volumetric powder bed fusion that's, that's being worked on um, under the direction of Dr. Seepersat, Dr. Beeman and myself, as well as Jared Allison, who's our operations manager. And the idea here is that we would dope a powder bed with um, a conductive material, and then we can irradiate the entire powder bed with radio frequency radiation and heat it selectively only where it's been doped so that we can get parts very quickly, volumetric sintering of, of parts very rapidly. On the right-hand side here, you'll see a LAMPS metrology machine that's being um, built by Dr. Beeman and Dr. Fish and their uh, graduate students. Um, and here, this the idea here is that we have a fully open source software and hardware machine that can uh, achieve very high levels of metrology of the process. So we have long wave infrared cameras, visible cameras, as well as OCT capabilities to be able to very carefully observe the process um, as parts are being built. And then finally, we also are doing some innovation in liquid polymers. And so this is a process that's being uh, pioneered by Dr. Tarani and myself and our research teams. The idea here is that we're combining two-part thermoset polymers um, and we're mixing them at the point of application through a mixing nozzle that you can see on the right-hand side. Um, and so the printed part you see here is made from a two-part epoxy. Um, this particular longhorn is about eight inches across and about an inch and a half thick, um, and it was printed in only two minutes. And so using this process, we can get highly isotropic properties. We can also grade the materials and, and insert fillers um, for different types of applications like active materials and things like that. And so finally, I wanna draw your attention to um, opportunities to collaborate with the center. And we'll come back to this at the end of the, of the program today. Um, but we're actively building an industrial affiliates program that we'd like to launch uh, later in 2021. And so there are opportunities to become founding members and engage with the center in a deeper way. Um, so these are opportunities to take a close look at the research that's being done, to sponsor some, some industrial affiliates related uh, research projects, um, to get early introduction to researchers and research that comes out of the center as well. We are also very interested in engaging in research projects that are either industry sponsored or government sponsored in partnership with industry, academia, national labs. 
um, and, fi and fabricating challenging parts. So if you have parts that are really, really difficult to build, we're really interested in working with you um, to try to move the additive manufacturing processes forward in terms of materials and process capabilities and design so that we can build more challenging parts. So with that, I um, invite you to contact us. Um, you'll see our contact information as well uh, later on. And I'd like to then move on to the um, panel discussion that we have as the highlight of our virtual launch today. Okay. All right, so first of all, I'd really like to thank all of our panelists for appearing today. Let me give a, a brief introduction to all of them. We're very grateful for them spending their time with us this morning. Um, and so our panelists today um, include David Lee, um, David is the Chief Technology Officer of EOS, where he's responsible for the global metal and polymer system product lines, software and innovation management, and continues to coordinate and support a global research and development team. Um, David brings more than 30 years of experience in the additive manufacturing industry, starting at DTM, which was one of the industry pioneers. He has also been involved in multiple additive manufacturing startups that have been acquired by various companies Prior to EOS, David served as Senior VP of Emerging Strategies at Stratasys. Kent Firestone um, is the Senior Vice President of Operations at EOS North America. He's responsible for overseeing the manufacturing, field service, logistics, quality, um, and materials activities of EOS's North American operations. Kent is a 30-year veteran of the additive manufacturing industry and has served in numerous engineering, operations, and management positions at Stratasys Direct Manufacturing, Solid Concepts, DTM Corporation, and 3D Systems during his career. Vikram Devarajan is the Managing Director of Evonics 3D Printing Technology Center in Austin. Uh, Vikram has been extensively involved in the 3D printing industry, specifically SLS, for the last decade. He co-founded Structured Polymers and led the company as CEO from its inception to an acquisition by Evonik Corporation. Starting with his work at Structured Polymers, Vikram has hands-on experience in identifying polymers and formulating additives for commercially available and in-development in powder-based additive manufacturing systems. Samantha Snaves is an officer in the Air National Guard and the CEO for V3D, the manufacturer of the large-scale Gigabot series of extrusion printers. Samantha and V3D are very focused on social responsibility, in particular, she facilitates connection be between others printing at the human scale and or using recycled materials to access locally driven manufacturing in more than 50 countries. A serial entrepreneur, Samantha volunteers as the global chair of the IEEE Entrepreneurship Steering Committee. Previously, she served as the social entrepreneur in residence for supporting NASA Johnson Space Center's Space Life Sciences Directorate after selling a startup for a DARPA funded tissue culture device. So welcome, David, Kent, Samantha, and Vikram. We're very, very pleased to have you here today. So for our first um, question for the panel, um, from your perspective, what is the biggest challenge facing the additive manufacturing industry today? Samantha, would you like to get us started? Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, aside from trying to print from garbage, which has its own complexities, I think one one challenge that we might all share is um, just the need to continue, regardless of the size of your company or where you are in the ecosystem, to push um, towards standards that can support the scaling and the adoption of, of additive um, and advanced manufacturing solutions where they make sense. Um, I know there's been a lot of criticism over the years that uh, you know, sales are limited to solutions or um, opportunity to, to, to support rapid prototyping and um, inroads at production scale uh, haven't, we don't see that across every industry because of um, limitations with standards. So whether it's with ASME or SAE or IEEE, um, America Makes, I think it's, it's incumbent on all of us to participate in good dialogue about uh, materials, types of printing, TDPs, if you're working with um, DOD to, to help this technology, um, because I, I think it it is at a point that it could be used in a lot of industries where it's not right now, um, truly reach uh, fruition. Yeah. So, Ken, you have a number of years of experience in service bureaus um, related to additive manufacturing. 
Um, do you have some unique sort of vantage points about some of the challenges that you'd like to share? Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. So yes, uh, I think um, to me, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we face, and it's been this way for a number of years, is machine-to-machine um, -machine repeatability uh, from the OEMs. And so I am, uh, it's one of the things that I'm going to try to focus on with the OS. Uh, and, um, but, uh, you know, in addition to that, I think another big issue is design for additive manufacturing. And I'm, I'm really talking about in the customer space. Um, many times as a service bureau uh, operator, we would see, um, you know, parts would come in from a customer and they were they were not designed for additive. They were, you know, trying to convert from machining prints or something like that. <clears throat> and the success is never as high uh, when you when you go that route. And so I think I think more focus on design uh, is is really needed to help push the industry forward. Great. OK, cool. David or Vikram, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, so I think the the first one is is just deconstructing the the question. What's the biggest challenge? You know, as engineers, we typically focus on the challenge, right? What's a you know a thermodynamic issue or a heat transfer issue or a polymer issue? But really, I think what we're saying is the what's the biggest hurdle for us to overcome so we can scale the technology? So if we look at it in that context, what's the biggest thing? I, I don't like to just look in a vacuum. I, I like to look, like to look across. And, and I'll start with a steam engine. We're not going to do the whole history of the world, but when you look at the steam engine, it was developed for a unique solution to pump water out of mines in the black country uh, in the UK. And so when they developed that steam engine to do that, they then started to create the study of thermodynamics, the need to do metrology, right? All of those things happened because of the steam engine. And then when they were able to put it on wheels and create trains, all of a sudden what was something to pump water is now uh, assisting in transportation is assisting in generating uh, power uh, instead of having to use horses. And so I think what we need is the killer app, right? The biggest challenge for us, because once we get that killer app, we'll figure out how to get machine to machine consistency because there will be a monetary incentive to do so. I think right now we're trying to push um, a, a pumping device to the world that really needs transportation. And I think that's what we have to figure out is which is the killer dev device that will assist us. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge when you look at it is sort of the intersection of what all the other panelists said, right? You've got the same material made by several manufacturers. You've got the same laser centering machines made by several different manufacturers. And you've got people who are trying to convert injection molding prints or uh, machining prints into additive manufactured parts and you don't have standards you're still using ASTM D638 right I think the intersection of those and how to overcome that is probably the biggest hurdle and challenge that lays ahead of us um, when an OEM is picking out a part today in machining they don't really say which tool you need to buy or which uh, CNC machining head you need to use. They just say go machine this part and then they have a QC process based on that. But today in additive manufacturing, if somebody's picking a part, uh, again, Kentel knows this better than anybody else. They go down to even saying what bead uh, blaster head pressure you need, right? So with that level of uh, specifications, is I think um, because the technology is still new in its earlier stages and as time moves on and it gets more ingrained, some of these things will vanish and it'll be more widespread. Yeah, those are really good insights. So, you know, that leads into the next question that I have. What what can research centers like ours do to move this forward, right? You know, in, in most of these really big research challenges, there's always there's a place for industry, right? There's a place for academia. What do you think, uh, what outcomes would you most like to see or what problems would you most like to see us tackle as uh, a research center? Um, Vikram, would you like to, to lead us off? Oh, I think absolutely. I'm actually honored to lead this question because I did. Uh, I am a product of that research center. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a thing. It's a good uh, thing. Yeah, good thing, right? So I think uh, Dr. Seeper said our research center is first of all right in the center of, like you mentioned, right, EOS and uh, ALM and just that, I don't know, the special Austin place. So the first thing the research center is doing is pushing out the next generation of designers and part imaginers that go out 
and write the specs for the material and design of the parts for the next 50 years moving forward, right? So definitely some emphasis on design for additive manufacturing using the, the complexities free from the machines that come out and uh, leveraging that is something the center should do. And I think the other thing that the center should really focus on is trying to take the available list of materials, the available list of machines, and the available list of testing equipment, like I'm talking post parts, right? And trying to combine them in a way to make some sort of a standard that somebody who's sitting in a parts division that's trying to order a part can sort of map back or maybe write the next generation of standards that eventually will be adopted by ASTM. I think that's probably what's uh, useful. That's going to be very useful moving forward. Mm -hmm. Good. David or Kent, do any comments on how a research center like ours, I mean, there are a number of them around the country, could really help maybe a larger, more established company like EOS? So I, th I think uh, and just to focus on one aspect of it, because the other panelists, I think we all have, uh, not that we have groupthink, but we have very similar perspectives. Um, I think the tip of the spear is something that universities can do. Many companies uh, in EOS or uh, an HP or anybody who's out there, they don't like to do a lot of failures. But in order to have a successful experiment, you need to have many failed experiments. And I think that's something that universities can really help the industry is to allow for a lot of failed experiments to get us and move us forward. And I think that's something that uh, you guys having everything that Vikram just described, having that all under one roof, working with key uh, partners to do that, you guys can do the really heavy lifting to get a success and then let industry run with it. Samantha, from you know the, your perspective as, as, as a startup, right? Um, what, do, what are your thoughts on what research centers like ours can, can do to help you move the industry forward? Yeah, I, I agree with both the panelists and especially what um, David mentioned. I think uh, research centers have a huge opportunity to offset some of the risk. You know, as OEMs ourselves, we're committed to product lines. And like for us, we say we offer lifetime customer support. So any any change or version um, can really you know mess up your opportunity to to support your customer well, and um, so then you have to have like basically a separate division even as a startup from day one in the OEM space that's committed to research and development and improvement. And it's, it's a lot of burden when you're just getting started. Hardware is hard as it is, and it requires requires a lot of capital outlay. So I think there's a huge potential to work with um, to have more successes like structured polymers and uh, to support the, the startup side of the fence um, by helping wrangle maybe institutional dollars and to um, you know, offer students and um, the opportunity to be placed within small businesses through you know, NSF support or whatnot, um, in addition to um, actually pushing the ball forward on the research end. More importantly, I think um, I really love, like one of the last projects you shared is you know, an open source technology, I think, Despite it being a small industry, uh, you know there's there's some competition, but really we're we're all fighting the same windmills. Um, and so I think what you provide is a way for everyone, you know, the HPs, the EOS, and Stratasys to stand shoulder to shoulder to really break down um, some of these hurdles. Um, and then finally, I would I would say, particularly in the U.S., it's been our observation that um, you know. There are a lot of students who are really interested in designing, maybe for AM or modeling, but there is not a big focus on training people how to use the machines, how to fix them, how to design for repeatability. And, um, and you may or may not even need to be a, a college student or an engineering student to do that. So I think there's a role for the educational institutions to provide um, content that could be used, you know, as UT does with ACC and um, in trade skills to really stimulate conversation around um, how these machines are not only um, designed, but you know how they're maintained and and to incite conversations with people of all different walks of life to truly um, allow this technology to scale and all over the world. Great. Um, so let me transition to my to my next question. I think one of the unique things that all of you bring to the table is that you've all been involved um, in startup companies in one form or another at one point, I guess, in your career. I know David and Kent, you were involved very early on in DTM Corporation, which was spun off from UT Austin, and then you've been in a number of companies since then. And Vikram, 
Um, you were involved in starting Structured Polymers and Samantha with Re3D. I think, you know, the additive industry is at such a point right now where there are a lot of entrepreneurs thinking about how to start their own companies and they have interesting ideas for how to move it forward. Um, and so I think all of you have had quite great success in this industry kind of starting and running companies. And so I wonder if you have some advice um, for people who are starting up their own companies in this area or maybe another way to ask that question would be what factors do you think may have contributed to the success um, of some of the companies that you've been involved in? Um, David, would you like like to start? Sure. Um, I think networking connections, I, we've already, I think Vikram mentioned it. I think several of us have talked about this kind of coalescence of, of these people that are able to kind of grow. Um, you know, what, you know, a, a grove or an orchard works much better than a single tree because they're able to pollinate each other. And I think you see that uh, in California, you know, with Silicon Valley and all of that, those startups. I think Austin has that. I think one is finding an area and that, and I don't know um, if anybody listens to podcasts or something, but Joe Rogan is like really big pushing Austin, all that stuff, trying to get all these comedians and people to move to the Austin area because they build each other up. And so I think good partners uh, in a good fertile soil like Austin is really a, a key contributor, at least for my uh, my success. Oh, I, I think David hit it right on the head. Um, I'm sure David will remember I was sitting for coffee with him at JP's Java. That coffee shop isn't there anymore. It was many, many, many years ago, and I was telling him about structured polymers, and his eyes just lit up, telling, let's go do it, right? And the same thing with Kent. I came to him in 2000, who knows when, right? And I told him we need some machine time to print and test this out, and Kent also saw the value of what we were doing. So the networking and connection is that, <clears throat> and on top of that, just keep your burn rate low. You know the the advice piece of it, right? Money is hard to raise. Don't spend it on fancy chairs. Um, that'll all come later. Just keep your burn rate low and use your network to go do whatever you can. Don't pay people. I, I love it. I love it. Right? The cherry wood office and the fancy chair can come later, right? Okay. That's right. Awesome. Samantha. Yeah, I would add, um, we've had the honor, especially during COVID, to do a lot of mentoring um, of aspiring hardware entrepreneurs and, and people aspiring to start 3D printing companies. And um, I often have to remind myself that, you know, my mom already loves me and our team loves our product and each other. Uh, but um, your your product, if you're an OEM or your material is is shaped by the how it's perceived in the community. And so the only way that you're gonna grow is by getting outside of your network and, and getting quick feedback. So we were fortunate to put a real donkey of a printer. Well, that, that's unfortunate, this is being recorded. But the first version of Gigabot, if you see it on our first Kickstarter campaign at South by Southwest in 2013, when we launched, uh, it was, was pretty rough. It was shot in Matthew's living room, the electrical box is on the floor, but golly, 23 20, people in 23 countries bought it and a lot of Fortune 100s and, uh, that bootstrapped, you know, bootstrapped our little um, factory and catalyzed our growth. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, the, the only, if we had held on to that printer and if we had mounted the electrical box, you know, maybe a year or two would have gone by and we would have spent a lot of money and we would have des designed it for ourselves. But by releasing it early, we're able to grow with community. So um, for students listening and people in this space know that, you know, there are a number of players of different sizes, but there is so much need and so much opportunity and um, until you throw it out there and, and take the risk, um, you're just kind of stuck in your head in the same echo chamber. So I would say go for it. And um, if if you want any lessons learned, feel free to reach out to our team on Re3D. We love sharing at least uh, what we would, maybe we could have done better or what not to do. Right, so yeah, that's an important lesson, right? You have to take risks and get feedback on what you're doing, right? So that you can move forward and grow. Um, Kent, you were with Solid Concepts for a number of years and then through Stratasys Direct, and so you really kind of saw sort of a successful company over the years, right? Um, any any factors that you think, you know, contribute to the success um, of, of keeping keeping a company going, gr growing, and being healthy over, over such a long period of time? Uh, yes, uh, so thanks, Carolyn. I, you know, in my mind, in any successful business, you've got to have the, the entire company uh, from the top all the way down to the 
you know, the custodian needs to have a shared vision, mission and purpose. And, uh, you know, everybody needs to be pulling in the same direction. And I think I saw that, uh, you know, I saw that at DTM. I saw that uh, with Solid Concepts. I saw that in Harvest Technologies when we merged with them. And I think that's a, that's a common, uh, you know, a core tenet, I believe, for successful companies. And then I think the second thing when it comes to additive, uh, with it at your customers, you have to really have uh, additive champions. Um, and we saw this at every large customer that we had, I think, at both the Harvest and, and uh, Stratasys Direct. Uh, you know, we always had, uh, there was always a champion with it internally that would help drive you know, designed for additive, uh, you know, converting part numbers that were traditionally manufactured into additive. And so I think those are, um, you know, those are two of the big components I see to be successful in this space. Great. So, so one of the questions I that I want to ask is a little bit even more forward looking. Um, you know, where do you see the additive manufacturing industry in 10 years, right? How will it be different from today? I mean, if we look back, all of us have been involved in this industry for quite some time. And if we look back to, to 10 years ago to 2011 and how that was very, very different, I think, from today, right? This industry is moving so quickly. Your crystal ball. I'm asking all of you to look into your crystal ball and tell us, you know, in 10 years, what do you think this industry is going to look like? Yeah, it's... Um it's it's being recorded so we got to be careful you know <laughs> so, <laughs> no i think if you look 10 years ago like today i think polymers was more it was leading more in the space than metals in the last year we've seen that switch a lot of that's driven by space not just aerospace but space exploration because they've got particular applications that they can print the whole thing in one and so it's really it's designed for additive they actually have an application again but back to the killer app so i think in in another 10 years we will have other killer apps uh, one on the polymer side is like align technologies which is um braces i think that's a 30 to 50 billion valuation company in the additive space, but they're using additive as a tool. So I think we're gonna have more aligns. Now, what, what are they gonna be? I mean, are they gonna be printing shoes or helmets for football players or more rockets for engines? I don't know, uh, but I, I do think we're gonna see more and more of these apps really drive the development of the technology around that. I agree. I, I do think that there'll be more print, more printers that are more accessible in, in more places. Um, you know, I think 10 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about having a printer in every house. Um, I, I personally um, don't think uh, that's the direction it's going. You know, not everyone has a garage like David's. Um, <laughs> and they may live in a studio de department. And as you look at printing functional things, obviously, obviously they're, they can be big and you may not have the space for that. But what I do think we'll see is, is just as what UT has done a fabulous job in, of, um, in this standing up at this research center and just in the history of the school and supporting advanced manufacturing is I think we're going to see more centers of excellence. So and, and especially too in non-traditional markets where there aren't hot spots of printers already. So thinking about, you know, we use, uh, uh, seeing printers throughout Europe and LADAM and Central America and Africa as well. And I think there's going to be hubs that are known for making car parts and there's going to be hubs that are more known for supporting um, aviation because it, it really is this ecosystem and community that has to rally together um, that will include local stakeholders um, as as well as, you know, those willing to take the risk um, in, the, in the startup space, in the small business space, materials providers and OEMs and research institutions that are really focused and and communities that will grow out of that. Um, and then, you know, it's a little bit self-serving, but I, I do think I would submit that I think there's a good conversation going on right now in the space around sustainability and natural materials. So I think we'll con continue to see companies um, explore what that means um, for their focus. Um, and I'm really excited to see where that leads. Um, I think in addition to the applications that uh, David and Samantha mentioned, I want to take a different look at the problem, right? Let's go back at some time when books were the only method of exchanging information. 
They were printed in one place in one country. Germany had some of the first printing presses and then they would ship books out all over the world, right? The Gutenberg Press. I think that'll change for spare parts in some form or the other. Wherein, I mean, today, if you wanted to print something, you would email a file and then it would be printed local. So I think man would not be lugging around or boats would not be lugging around spare parts all over. Now they may be lugging around, you know, Ivonic powders or EOS printer machines where they are at the end install base. But I think the way the value chain and the amount of miles traveled by the end part will significantly change if you look at it. Now that may not happen in 10 years. It may take 20 or 100. But um, I think as Carl Decker said it, right? They're really the founder, at least from the UT's perspective. As long as mankind is alive, there'll be some machine somewhere making parts using the 3D printing sintering technology somewhere. So I think we can see a lot of revolution on the way that parts are made and handled and shipped and installed. So I think, um, you know, David mentioned the killer app and I and I believe uh, very strongly that applications will drive the growth in this industry. They always have. Um, you know, I think what we hope we will see in 10 years is more and more of those where it's, it's a more commonplace thing. I mean, today you can probably name the number of killer apps that, that really drive a lot of revenue for companies, uh, you know, on a, on a single piece of paper. And so I think, you know, 10 years from now, we'll have a lot more of that. And in my mind, you know, there's one of the metrics we look at, uh, at least in the parts business, uh, was, you know, what percentage of our uh, our parts that we're producing uh, yearly were production applications. And typically that would run in the uh, 35 to 40 percent range. And it grew a lot uh, during the from, say, 2000. Five to 2015, and we would we would typically see that grow a couple of percent, maybe five percent a year. I think 10 years from now, for the you know, it, for us to be successful, we probably need to have that number closer to 65 percent production applications and 35 percent, uh, you know, prototypes. Let's call it because I think that's that's where the sustainability uh, will come from and the recurring revenue to help grow and continue to fund that growth. So. Great, so I wanted to, to transition. We have a couple of um, so a few um, good audience questions that I wanted to um, ask. Um, and one is from the audience is, will advancements in additive manufacturing lower the price of these products so they're more accessible to the general public? Um, and the second part of the question is, if not, then what is the motivation behind doing more research in additive manufacturing? So I think it's a question around pricing and accessibility and things like that. I'll, I'll question uh, David. Go ahead. Now, I'll, I'll I'll jump on the second part. What's the motivation for research if you're not going to lower the cost? I think it it opens the opportunity, right? It's a value, right? Uh, launching something to space is obviously going to cost a lot of money, uh, so it's not just a commodity. So I think that that's one of the values is really opening the doors to things we couldn't have done before. So I, I that's the first uh, kind of popcorn answer. And to add to that, I want to address the cost issue, right? People usually complain about the cost of the feedstock for additive manufacturing. No one really looks back and sees how many millions of dollars it takes and how many thousands of print tests it takes to put a feedstock out into the market, right? All of that needs to be recouped somehow. So I think the answer to that is as the adoption curve and the killer apps drive the material and machine consumption up, people can make more. I'm sure at some point a ground titanium bar that meets a particular diameter spec would have been super duper expensive and over time the cost slowly comes down because it's being, you know, a lot of it's being made. So I think volume of consumption is going to drive the cost exponentially down. And until we see the volume and mass adoption, AM is still going to be a niche. Let's put stuff into uh, David's garage and the Mars sort of applications, right? If it needs to come to the University of Texas garage, I think a lot more of it needs to be used and sold. Yeah, you know, Samantha mentioned earlier the uh, the printer in every home concept that was uh, popular, you know, back in the early 2010s. And uh, I personally, having been in this industry for 30 years, I've never really felt that was a realistic 
uh, approach. Uh, you know, when you talk about cost for for adding, it's not to me. It really boils down to the cost of the parts, not so much the cost of the printers. And granted, one is driven by the other. But uh, you know, if if the general public needs a part, you know, done. They can go to uh, a service provider and get that part typically for you know fairly inexpensively but if we're talking about putting printers in every home then that's a different conversation so i you know to me the the cost ecosystem is really it really should be driven by the applications which you know in turn is kind of parts not so much the printers themselves there are companies out there that will get the printers and put them in and build you parts for a very reasonable price so Yeah, I would echo the the comment on demand um, from you know the OEM perspective. It's it's no secret because you can sign up for a virtual tour of our factory. We do batch manufacturing in ten thousand square feet in um, Houston, Texas, and it costs us a lot more um, at times to source and produce the printers because we we handcraft them ourselves um, with a team in the U.S. So where you you see the cost parity, at least on the desktop side, it's you know when they're being produced on big lines overseas, they and in China, um, and uh, until there's the demand for, you know, in our segment, large format 3D printers, uh, you know, I have to deal with inventory holding and you know paying fair wages in, in the U.S. and all the other stuff that comes with it, and um, it's only going to drop so much until you really can justify that raise to have a full automated production line to crank them out, and and just as Vikram shared, you know, that that cost of the titanium um, rod then gets a lot lower over time when you're at that that level, but it's just not there. We, we um, sat in a really interesting conference called Renew 3D hosted by the University of Maine last week. And um, one of the analysts that opened up made the comment that in the, the large format pellet space, for which you know there is only a handful of players, there's only 31 units that have been sold or captured for in-house research in the entire United States. So it's no wonder that those machines cost a million bucks. Um, so I think you know until there's more adoption, um, and and quite frankly, purchases of these printers were just it's it's going to be a little bit pricey for a bit. So so it's interesting just from from my perspective, I teach the additive manufacturing class at, at UT, and and so I teach it every two years. And um, every two years, the students ask me about the price of making parts and the price of constituent materials, right? Like polymer powders and metal powders. And, and every time I go back and I look and I do my homework and I try to make sure that I know how much this stuff costs. And it is interesting to me to see that, that prices for some of the feedstocks, for example, have been coming down. Um, and so if I go back and I look at my notes from say 10 years ago, you know, the price of powder feedstock, polymer powder feedstock, for example, has been going down or has gone down at least over the last 10 years. So some of the things that you're saying are ringing true, right? We're not there yet where it's it's so it's it's inexpensive, like you know, going out to the grocery store and buying some something or going to Target and buying something. But the prices, we are seeing that economy of scale taking effect at least a little bit, right? But I think your point is really well made that that we need more of it, right? We need a bigger industry, which will then um, allow a lot of these prices to come down. So there's been some talk in the chat. Um, about using additive for parts that are no longer made. Um, and so I think there may be some questions about what percent of business do you, do you see this as being a uh, part, a big part of driving additive manufacturing or a small part of driving additive manufacturing. So sort of, I think, building legacy parts and replacement parts and things like that. So how, how, what do you see that being as part of the sector? Um, it's been probably 10 to 15 years ago. I think it was Dr. Burrell and I uh, from the Austin area participated in, uh, with DARPA on what investment we could make in additive um, to really move the needle. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion. Uh, ultimately, it's a it's a it's a multivariable problem, right? Cost obviously is one of them. Uh, the the speed at which you can produce something is also something else. Uh, but the other one is is really the engineering behind it. Uh, what what they really felt that the first step in getting us to where we can actually produce these parts for spare parts was getting the systems 10 to 100 times faster because they're not going to be cheap systems, but we maybe can make them more productive. And so I think that was the first layer. But really something that nobody's solved yet is really the engineering behind it. 
I could print you in my garage on a MakerBot printer uh, what they call in the uh, in the helicopter world the Jesus nut. It's the nut that's on the top of the little shaft that holds all of the blades together. And, and they call it the Jesus nut because if that fails, all the blades fall off and you uh, and your helicopter are going to go meet Jesus. So anyway, so I could print one of those, right? I could even take the CAD file and print it. But CAD and printing is not the whole engineering, right? It's materials, it's inspections, it's, it's all of that. I think that's the one thing we really need to work on is how can we take legacy designs that were designed for something other than additive and translate it into additive speak, right? Can I make that on a 3D printer with titanium when it was designed for, I don't know, cobalt chrome or whatever it was designed with? Um, so anyway, that's I think that's the, for me, uh, the main thing is the design uh, engineering packet. Um, and I will say companies are doing that now. Uh, we worked with Boeing on one case where they needed to have some spare parts shipped to a place where they had a aircraft that was down and they couldn't get the spare parts to them in, in time. So they actually had their engineering team design the packet for additive uh, within a day or two and then print them. But there's just not enough digital twin information yet. Anyway, that's my take. I couldn't agree with you more and I can speak briefly as an airman myself and supporting a project called Air Force Maker. I um, have helped uh, push that allows uh, DOD customers internally to share design files. And what blows my mind is a lot when we talk about part obsolescence, you know, DOD is obviously an extreme example, but um, a number of the components that are on, you know, these ground equipment or airframes or ships they were made by companies that may or may not exist, and they may predate, predate CAD. There may, there may not be a digital model. So scanning technology has to evolve, digital twins, as David mentioned, and then thinking about the security, whether it's blockchain or anything else, of that digital thread um, to ensure that quality um, components are made. Um, systems for automating TDPs, our te technical data packages, are still being designed. Um, in order to control how parts are made and then to vet suppliers and um, vet OEMs, which traditionally also is biased to really large companies, not that there's anything wrong with that, but as you see inroads with new companies like structured polymers, you also have to have the capture um, to be able to work and, and to qualify and certify um, these, these solutions that new companies are offering very quickly. But it's, it's super complex um, when it comes to that problem set. Great. So um, we're running here to the, about the last uh, five minutes or so of our panel. And so I know we have a lot of students who are logged in watching this panel. And so many of them, I think, are, are asking themselves, this is a really cool industry. I'd really like to be involved. So what advice could you give them um, for preparing themselves uh, to enter this industry and for entering this industry? Maybe I'll, I'll go I'll, first. I'll no, take a second. I think Ken, Ken, Ken was about to say something. Ken, go ahead. Yeah, Ken, okay. Ken, first. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need, you know, be, being in the industry, we need every day we're looking for uh, graduates that have experience. And, um, you know, having that experience, you know, coming out of college with, with the amount of, you know, knowledge that I'm seeing in some of the recent engineers that we've hired uh, out of UT or other schools that have uh, good additive uh, departments really helps them hit the ground quickly and, and uh, you know, become a real productive member of our team in a, in a short amount of time. So I think the thing to focus on, you know, it kind of depends on where you want to go uh, once you do get out of school, but certainly additive technologies is, is, is you know probably the first place to start and then you know you can take it deeper and start to look at design uh we've all commented on how we think design for additive manufacturing is one of the most critical uh parts uh you know uh, of growing this industry and so design for additive and then finally additive materials you know and, and you know if you want to kind of specialize all those are are very uh high on our list of you know when we're trying to look at a candidate and make a decision on hiring, seeing those types of, uh, that, that, that type of experience on your resume helps, helps us make that decision. 
Can, and to add on to what Ken said, I think the one piece of not advice, but what we did is get your hands dirty, right? Like um, I'm sure David and I know Kent and Samantha, when there were times when prints don't work, Kent will come and maybe bump the bed temp a couple of degrees up or down, left or right. It's because each and every one of us have gotten our hands dirty, whether it's cleaning parts. Again, I come from the SLS world, whether it's changing the roller, trying different things. There is no substitute for doing it yourself. No amount of YouTube videos is going to teach you that. You get powder all over yourself, go take a shower. But I think um, there's nothing short of doing it yourself because it gives you the perspective of what to expect. And if even here when we develop materials, I print with it and I clean it out myself to know that when we sell this powder to a customer, will they be happy doing it? And I think that's also the recipe to build fantastic products that people will pay a lot of money for. Um, so get your hands dirty. I think one thing um, is uh, a word I, he I heard from my family is this thing, Kentucky windage. Kentucky windage is when you're going to shoot at something, you need to account for the wind or lead the target. You're not going to aim right at the target because if you aim at the target, you're going to miss. And so I think number one is do your research on what you'd like to do and where additive may be going. Because right now, if somebody saw the shift back in the early 2010s to 2015, shift towards metals and then started to do what Vikram and, and Kent just said, started to kind of get dirty and get practical experience in metals, right now there's probably four or five companies that have just started in the last year or two. They've raised billions of dollars to do metal additive for space, right? And they're trying to scale up fast and there's not enough people. So if somebody would have started working towards that, they would have a great landing spot right now. So do your research on what you'd like to do and where you can intersect with 3D printing. I guarantee you, if you if you lead that target, you'll find a place to land because there's a huge demand for talent right now. Absolutely, I think we're all hiring. So look us up, but <laughs> outside of that, um, I couldn't agree more. You know, in in our interview process, we you know we're we're asking you now to try and put something together or to turn the printer on. Yeah. Also, it's a way to shamelessly get um, feedback on usability. Um, and and the only way you're going to get that experience is just to start now. So on top of what everyone said, I would just layer a sense of urgency. Uh, go to your garage tonight, or David's garage, or <laughs> the UT Center of Excellence. Turn on a printer. Feel free to well. Maybe not the gigabots in there, but feel free to break the uh, hardware because that's that's how you're going to learn and um, how we're going to grow together as an industry. So we can't wait to see what you print. All right. Cannot unmute. All right, can you hear me now? Great. Yes. Sorry about that uh, technical difficulty, but I wanted to, to thank so much our panelists for joining us today. I think they've given us a lot to think about, both those of us who are researchers and practitioners, as well as the students who are coming up through the ranks thinking about joining um, additive the additive manufacturing industry as they move forward. Um, so thanks again to these panelists for spending their time and sharing their insights with us today. Um, so next on our uh, agenda is a virtual tour of the center. Um, I think I speak for everyone involved with the center when I say that nothing would make us happier uh, than to host all of you for an in-person tour of our new center uh, when COVID protocols allow us to travel and meet freely again. Um, but for now, we've organized the next best thing. So we invite you to stick around for the next few minutes um, and please join us for a virtual tour of our facilities. My name is Carolyn Seepersad. I'm the faculty director of the new Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation. We're very excited to offer you a virtual tour of our space today. Our primary mission uh, is to perform fundamental research that accelerates the adoption of additive manufacturing worldwide through innovative materials processing, process innovation, controls, and design. Come on in. Let's take a look. 
So our additive manufacturing center includes eight founding faculty members who have a number of research test beds scattered throughout campus, ranging from very innovative micro laser sintering of metals to reactive extrusion of polymers to flash sintering of ceramics and a number of things in between. The core of the center, the new part of the center though, is here on the ground floor of ETC, which is our mechanical engineering building on the University of Texas at Austin campus. We have more than 3,000 square feet of space. It's separated into separate rooms for metals powder bed fusion, or EMLS, for polymer powder bed fusion, or SLS, and for liquid photopolymers, including stereolithography um, and digital anatomy equipment. We also have separate facilities for metrology as well. So at this point, I'd like to introduce you to our operations manager, Dr. Jared Allison, who will take you into further detail on each of these rooms. Hello, my name is Jared Allison, and today I'm going to walk you through some of the new capabilities we have at the Additive Manufacturing Center, starting with our EOS M280 Direct Metal Laser Sintering Machine. Using this system, we can fabricate nearly fully dense metal parts with complex internal and external geometries. We're currently processing 316 stainless steel, but we can also process other metals in the future, such as titanium alloys, inconel, and aluminum alloys as well. With this machine, we can make custom one-off parts, like this custom-designed gear, and also complex lattice structures with a high performance that couldn't be fabricated using any other method. This process takes metal powders and fuses them together using a laser. Thin layers of the metal powder are spread across the built surface, and a 400-watt laser scans the cross-section of the part to melt the powders to the previous layer. This allows complex parts to be made directly, without the need to melt off any binders as some other methods require. The build envelope is about 10 by 10 by 12 inches, so parts within those dimensions are well within the range of what we can fabricate here at UT. After the parts have been built and extracted from the machine, there's a variety of post-processing techniques we have at the center to create our finished parts. We have a furnace for heat treating and stress relieving the parts after the build. And since the parts are essentially welded to the build plate, we can cut them off using our bandsaw. We can also treat the surfaces of the parts using several methods in the form of grinders and sanders, abrasive bead blasting, and a vibratory polisher to improve the surface quality of the fabricated parts. Any other machining efforts required can be done at the full surface machine shop right across the hallway. There are numerous applications for this technology in the biomed, energy, and aerospace sectors, and we're very excited to have this capability at UT to support those industries and more. Next, I'd like to show you our 3D Systems SLA 5000 Stereo Lithography Machine, which is part of the Liquid Polymer Lab at the center. This system uses UV curable liquid polymer resins such as epoxies and acrylates to fabricate parts with tight tolerances and smooth surface finishes. This machine in particular has an impressive 20 by 20 by 23 inch build volume, offering a lot of flexibility in the types of parts that can be we're still in the process of getting this machine set up at the center, but we've already begun making small, small test parts using a transparent resin. The build process starts by filling a vat with liquid resin and submerging the build plate to evenly coat it into a fine layer. Then, a UV laser scans the build surface according to the part geometry, and the build plate is once again submerged into the resin vat to recoat the surface. After the part is finished, it is lifted from the resin vat to drain out the excess. Then the part is cleaned with isopropyl alcohol and support structures are removed. Finally, it's post cured in a UV oven to achieve the final part quality. Potential applications for this technology include robotics, where surface finish and tolerances can be critical, to surgical planning, where the transparent resins can be used to visualize surgical roots. We're very excited to have SLA capabilities here at the center. Moving on, I'm very excited to show you our Stratasys J750 digital anatomy printer. While this machine uses similar materials to the SLA 5000, it processes them in a fundamentally different way to achieve unique capabilities. It all starts in the material cabinet that houses cartridges of liquid resin that have different colors and mechanical properties. The resin is then pumped into the print heads on the machine and deposited as tiny droplets, much like the inkjet printer you may have at your house. UV lamps on either side of the print heads cure the resin as it is jet onto the surface, allowing for high resolution printing and layer thicknesses as low as 14 microns. After the build, the support structures are removed with a water jet and dissolved in a recirculating alkaline bath. The inkjet technology allows multiple materials to be mixed during printing to offer full color parts, as well as parts with graded mechanical properties, like this honeycomb that combines flexible and rigid portions. 
The digital anatomy printer can also use resins that are pre-formulated to mimic human bone and tissue, which can aid in surgical planning efforts and reduce the need for cadavers, like this heart model that has the look and mechanical properties of a real human heart. We can't wait to explore all of the functionality this machine provides. For those of you that didn't know, UT Austin is the birthplace of selective laser sensory, one of the most established processes for polymer powder bed fusion additive manufacturing. SLS was developed by Dr. Joe Beeman and Carl Deckard in the 80s, and this is our 3D Systems High-Q Selective Laser Sintering Machine. This process allows you to make functional and use parts with a high degree of complexity because support structures are not required. Parts can be nested within the build volume to maximize machine utilization. There are a variety of materials available, but nylon is one of the most common. I have a couple parts that were made on this machine to highlight its versatility. This part has a highly complex nested internal geometric feature that would be difficult or impossible to fabricate any other way. I also have a functional part in the case of this snap-through spring element that can be used in energy absorption applications. This process works in a similar way to the metal laser sintering machine, where thin layers of polymer powder are spread across the build surface. Then, a laser scans the part area to melt the powder and create the part geometry. After the parts have been removed from the build chamber, they are separated from the unfused surrounding powder known as the cake, and the excess powder can be cleaned off. SLS generally requires fewer post-processing steps than some of the other additive manufacturing methods, making it quite attractive for complex parts. Applications for SLS can include end-use part fabrication, small lot manufacturing, aircraft ductwork, prosthetics and orthotics, or any other area where geometric customization is desired. This rich history of selective laser sintering development continues today at UT with our experimental lamps machine that is fully instrumented to allow predictive process control for enhanced part quality. So thank you, Jared, for that fantastic tour of some of our commercial equipment in our new Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation. We'd also like to invite you to explore all of our research highlight videos. These videos are intended to highlight many of the research test beds that we have across uh, campus that we haven't been able to highlight in this video tour. So please take a look at all that fundamental basic research um, that's feeding into the future of additive manufacturing. We'd also like to mention that in addition to the, to the machines you've seen in our tour today, we also have quite a bit of characterization equipment that's available. Our center includes a CMM machine, a universal tension and compression testing machine, and we have access to a wide variety of microscopy and other materials characterization capabilities across campus. And finally, we invite you to work with us. We hope that this center will just be the foundation for further research in additive manufacturing. And with your help, we'll be able to grow the widespread of adoption of additive manufacturing throughout the country and throughout the world. So please get in touch with us and continue this journey with us. All right, so as Jared and I mentioned, we invite you to visit our website to view some of the research highlight videos of some of the exciting research test beds that are under, under development by our faculty and students. Um, but at this point, to conclude our program, we'd like you to join us for a ceremonial ribbon cutting, followed by some closing remarks and, and opportunities to get involved in some closing Q&A. All right, we're very, very excited to be here today for the ribbon cutting on our new Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation. Um, and as we cut the ribbon, I just wanted to, to thank all the people um, who helped make it happen, including the Cockrell School of Engineering. We have Dean Wood with us today. The Wofford Department of Mechanical Engineering. We have Chair Rick Neptune with us today, as well as all the fa founding faculty members who helped get it off the ground. All of our industrial partners who are helping us as well. And also a big thank you to Jared Allison, who's our founding operations manager, um, who made all of this happen. All right, so thank you once again for joining us today uh, for the 
virtual opening of our Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation. I'd like to thank all the panelists. I'd like to thank all the founding faculty members who are responsible for all of the exciting research test beds that you saw. And I'd particularly like to thank the Walker Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Cockrell School of Engineering for providing the resources to make this center possible. Once again, I'd like to draw your attention to all of the founding faculty members here. Um, these folks are responsible for all of the exciting research test beds that you saw at the beginning um, of the opening. And as I mentioned, um, collectively, these faculty members have over 100 years of experience in research and development around additive manufacturing. So please do feel free to reach out to any one of them um, to engage with them on research projects of interest to you. Um, and you'll find all of their contact information on the center website. And finally, I just wanted to, to mention some opportunities to collaborate. Um, we do have, we are um, seeding an industrial affiliates program um, that we plan to launch later in, in the year, later in 2021. And as part of that industrial affiliates program, um, we're inviting founding members to join us this year. There will be opportunities to engage more deeply with the center, um, streamlined interactions with faculty and student researchers, early introduction to research conducted by members of the center, um, opportunities to conduct uh, multi-company seed projects of interest to members and other opportunities of that type. We'd also would like to invite um, those in the, in the additive manufacturing industry or in other industries to engage with us on industry-sponsored or government-sponsored um, research projects. Um, we also are welcoming those who are interested in fabricating challenging parts and would like to work with us to see how we might be able to build parts that are really very difficult to build any other way. And finally, uh, we are the, a university, the University of Texas at Austin, and one of our primary missions is education and training. And so we'd really like to invite graduate students and undergraduate students who'd like to be involved to reach out to us. Um, and we also look forward to providing opportunities for these students to engage in challenging research projects in the future. So with that, I'd like you to invite you to follow us and reach out to us um, with further questions. All right, I think we already have a, a few questions in the Q&A that we can get started with. So one of the first questions is asking about the makerspace. So um, how are we working with the makerspace and how are we different or similar to the makerspace? Right, sure. So I'm glad someone mentioned that. We have um, a fantastic um, Texas Invention Works on campus, which we uh, didn't talk a lot about today, but they are very student centered. Um, so if we have students on campus who'd like to build parts for themselves, the Invention Works really is the place to go. Um, they have amazing resources in terms of desktop additive manufacturing machines, small CNC machines. I think they even have a Gigabot. Um, we heard from the founder of Gigabot earlier. So that really is the place to go for student entrepreneurship and student inventions. And that's going to continue to stay that way. It's a wonderful resource for students. Um, our center is a little bit different in the sense that we um, don't have a lot of personal or desktop um, 3D printing capabilities. In fact, we, we, we really don't focus on those at all. Uh, instead, we focus on commercial machines um, and research projects. So we're very research focused. So students who engage with us um, will be those who are working on research projects or potentially senior design projects, things like that, that really make use of these research scale machines. Awesome. We also had um, some other questions that were asking about how UT Austin students as well as non faculty at UT can get involved with the center. Sure. So we are actively, if you are at the University of Texas, we are more than um, happy to, to work with you. We are um, interested in recruiting additional faculty affiliates for the center. So if you'd like to be involved with the center, um, just reach out to us and let us know, and we're 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 very happy to uh, engage with other faculty members within engineering and also outside of engineering. So we understand that there are lots of um, really interesting applications for additive manufacturing in medicine, in architecture, in natural sciences, in the arts, 
And so we're very happy to engage. Um, if you are outside of UT, again, you know, we are very interested in building research partnerships with a wide variety of, of companies and individuals. Um, if you're a faculty member at another institution and you have ideas for research projects, you know, reach out to us. We just we'll, we need to have a conversation, figure out what, what you're interested in, what, what you'd like to do, and what are the mechanisms for funding the work that you'd like to do. We are in the process of setting up um, a um, a pricing template so that if um, folks who are outside of UT or even within UT, um, especially within UT, but also outside would, would like to engage with us and make parts, we have an opportunity to be able to um, recuperate the costs of that. And that's something we're working on as well. So we can talk to you about that if you're interested in, in working with us to make some challenging parts. Great. Yeah. So uh, we also had another question. Um, what industries do you think would benefit most from what we have at the center? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think some of the panelists mentioned some of the industries that have really been um, taking advantage of additive manufacturing uh, the most. Um, the aerospace and space industries, of course, um, find additive manufacturing very beneficial because they can build very lightweight parts. Many of the parts that they build are, are one-off parts so they're building custom satellites and other custom infrastructure and so additive manufacturing that's one of its real niches is this ability to build you know a single part um, without having to invest in lots of tooling that would be required to build it in some other way um, so the aerospace and space industries are are a big uh, market another market is the medical industry um, so you see medical industry using for example metal additive manufacturing quite a lot for implants um, so those implants can be custom made in some cases. You can also tailor things like porosity so that you get bone ingrowth into implants. Um, so the medical industry is key. We can also use some of our machines for, we can also use some of our machines to build um, surgical tools for practice. Um, so robotical, robotic surgery researchers, for example, can practice with some of our, um, some of the parts that we build in our machines. Um, and then so the medical industry is a big one as well. Oil and gas and energy industry can also be um, a good industry for this. Um, so many of the parts that they build are complex, um, sometimes downhole tools that require uh, complex flow structures um, and need to be able to withstand high temperatures and pressures. And so that's that's been a big market as well. And then more broadly, there are a number of industries that can really take advantage of additive manufacturing Sometimes for some of the lower cost pro processes, they'll use that to make fixtures to hold things when they do other tooling operations or assembly operations. Um, some other companies are starting to use additive for replacement parts and legacy parts, which I think some of our panelists mentioned as well. Um, so instead of having to keep an old manufacturing process alive, um, they can build these parts more in a one-off on-demand uh, type of scenario. And then I think um, you'll also see a little bit more distributed manufacturing. So if you look at, for example, the military and defense, you'll see them starting to use these machines more in the field to build, again, to build parts as needed um, closer to the point of application. So the industries are very, very widespread um, for the use of additive manufacturing. So we had a follow up from an earlier question about the makerspaces. Um, they were wondering how we plan on interfacing with the existing makerspaces in town outside of UT, some of these ones that have been around a little bit longer and are a bit more established. Right, so we'd, we'd welcome partnerships with them. Um, you know, so one of the things we are is a university, um, and so we, we do specialize as well in, in education um, and training, and so one of the things that, that could be useful um, could be um, short courses that help um, educate users on how to use these machines and what the capabilities are. Um, I think I mentioned before as well that we're happy to engage with partners who are interested, you know, in building complex parts um, and, you know, things that might involve a little bit of research into, into how would you make this part? Do you need a new material? Do you need a new process um, to be able to do this? Um, and so if there are members of the audience who are involved or running these types of maker spaces around town, we certainly invite you to get in touch with us. We'd love to build partnerships and there could be great ways to engage that I haven't mentioned. And we're certainly, we're certainly open to that. 
Great. It looks like that about rounds up the questions we've had in the, the chat so far. All right, great. Thank you, Jared, for um, fielding all those questions for us. And I'd like to thank the audience once again for joining us. And we look forward to um, engaging with, with all of you. So if you have um, a project that you'd like to talk to us about, we're happy to, to talk. And we look forward to building partnerships with many of our industry sponsors, with, um, with other academic institutions, with government institutions, as well as um, other folks out there in, in, in the public. So thank you once again um, on behalf of all the members of the center. Thank you for joining us today.